All right, I'm gonna continue with the UEFI applications proper here. I might do things similarly in the, well, as I did in the intro video as, as for like a Hello World example, but I'll probably still start these off with like a blank slate, maybe just copying over the make file so I can build something <laughs> correctly. But I wanna kind of ease into it a little bit by saying we can still start with the text input and output for this, like a simple text input output protocol, but get more of a deeper understanding of how UEFI is laid out first to kind of, you know, get get a better understanding of it overall. Like how is it put together with the, the type def structs and function pointers just to make it a little more understandable if you're coming at this from a, a, a new, a newer perspective than I am at this point. So I have my, uh, my repo open UEFI. I just wanted to show that I got nothing in here, so I'm going to start from whatever I have in here from the hello world and stuff example. And just to make sure I remember recurse submodules because I'm using the GPT image creator. And you actually need to provide a URL for that. So you might have to use HTTPS. I'm using SSH here so that I can update the repo from, you know, this repo here. But I'll just go ahead and get that. I think I set up my SSH finally on here correctly. I had different locations where it was at in my home. Um, it is a little bit slower on Windows than I'm used to on Linux as well, but I had it open already, so I figure I'll go back and forth maybe every video or two and just to make sure things build on both and that I have workflow down on both, depending what people are doing, I guess. It'll just look different, but I'm going to do everything the same anyway. So we have this here. I have all that stuff here, that's good, okay. So the EFI.c. So right now that's just like a hello world example thing here, right? We're building it. Let's just do make, it makes the thing. And then it copies, um, and copies into the image creator so we can go into there. And let's say I'm on Windows so I have the bat file here, depending on what I'm making. Uh, we have to actually make the thing, so let's do that. Write GPT, so by default, I don't think it'll make a VHD file, but we'll say we're gonna make a VHD file because the bat specifies that right here. BIOS is fine. Let me use the GTK display just so I can zoom in. Machine Q35 is good for emulation, so I have access to uh, uh, Intel's ICH9 controller hub and. ACPI and things if we want to mess with it later. Dash net none so that it doesn't try PXE boot and we won't have internet support, but if we want to mess with that, we can add that back. I just wanted a faster boot time. So if I go and load this, just to make sure my example from the first video still works, it works. All right. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> I always got to have sanity checks, right? That works for Hello World. So I'm going to Let's copy everything in there, and I'm just going to put it under, we'll say, hello EFI, just so I have a, a stable example there. But in my regular EFI.c, let's say I get rid of everything. And I'll just touch EFI.c, just so I have a blank slate to work from. We got the make file here. I guess I'll use Clang. That's fine. This is just set up. I'm not going to go over this, but it's just set up for building... Um, an X, a boot x64 EFI application, so we can boot automatically from it. And then it copies it into the folder for the image creator that I made in the last however many videos, <laughs> six, I can't remember. But that's all that's doing. We'll change this up a bit later for making like an example kernel and things. But right now this is, that's fine. So we have EFI.c, there's nothing in there right now. And that's okay. So if we do make, it's not gonna make anything because there's nothing there. There is no EFI main. So I guess I'll lay that out, but wait, how do we know what to do? How do we know what to put into this file? Well, that's why I had this spec here to start going over. So, all right, <laughs> I'll get a little bit deeper understanding before I go through with this and we'll go through there. So probably not much I'm gonna go over in the first couple chapters until we start getting to where we need to define some types in chapter two, but this does give you a high level of how the specification itself is laid out. If you need to know that kind of stuff, UEFI is kind of built off of its own driver model and protocols and functions to work with those protocols, and that's fine. We can go into that as we go along. Really, the protocols are just type def C functions. So if we look down here at something like, if I see something with protocol, these are functions that work to return protocols, right? 
But if I go to a protocol itself, like loaded image, all this is, the protocol is just the type def struct in the spec. So a C style struct, just laying out how memory is in some area. And then you'll have, you know, different fields in there. You might have different function pointers. You might have other protocols nested in there, but that's all. When it mentions a protocol, you can think of it programmatically as just a struct, if that helps, if that helps make more sense. An organization, what else we have? The goals, you know, you can read about that as you want. I guess I am the target audience as far as an OS dev. I guess I won't be adapting a shrink wrap operating system. I'm not selling, you know, a thing in a box in a store <laughs> right now. Maybe later on, I don't know, probably not. But here we have a, a chart of, or a graph. Well, what is this? A picture, I don't know. <laughs> a low resolution text and boxes image conceptual overview. So what we're going to be writing is the EFI OS loader here. So the OS will be loaded by the OS loader that we'll be writing. And we're going to write an OS loader as opposed to some drivers, you know, that they don't show here. But anyway, <laughs> the OS loader can talk to EFI's boot and runtime services, which happened before you call exit boot services as a function we'll go over later and load an OS. If, before you do that, we'll have access to boot services. But before and after booting an OS, we'll have access to the runtime services, at least the ones that are available after calling exit boot services. <laughs> so stuff like shutting down the PC is a runtime service, EFI reset shutdown, and that'll be available to call from our OS loader. Boot services will include things like memory allocation and um, just different things you might need to set up, booting an OS, like getting a memory map, setting the graphics output protocol for a, a text or graphics resolution, a video mode, if you will. Um, these things are on top of the hardware of your machine, and this is sort of a disk that this is showing, the EFI system partition, which we wrote as part of the GPT disk image creator tool. Our OS loader will be a file within that EFI system partition. It'll be named rex64, boot x64.efi. So that'll be that file within the partition, within the hard drive, within the hardware, <laughs> the machine. And you can talk to the hardware through an interface to firmware, which is what EFI is, through the interfaces provided by firmware that are the boot and runtime services here and protocols and things therein. There's also some tables that are provided for S ACPI, SMBIOS, System Management BIOS, and other things that you might want if they're available. You can look those up. Those, those will be the configuration tables available from the overall system table passed to your image's entry point. Okay, that's a mouthful so far, but what do we got? Driver model, goals, should be good to work with pretty much. <laughs> you can read this stuff on your own. I'm trying to skim and search for, you know, relevant info. So the UE5 protocols are basically C-style data structures. They might have fields like function pointers or just scalar values, if you will. It'll have most everything, including protocols, will have a unique ID, and you can use that later if you search for uh, let's say like locate handle or handle protocol or locate handle buffer. You can get all of the device handles, which is just like an abstract. Uh, it's a C void pointer effectively, but just an abstract interface to a device or to something in the firmware. We can have a handle to something in the firmware uh, for a given protocol or other things. And you do that by specifying a GUID in a few places. And this is nice because you can have a specific reference to whatever you're looking for. If you want to get something to open a memory map, you can use the EFI GUID for, you know, allocating memory or something. So that's nice. You can, you can search for things specifically and in different ways, and it's, it's pretty flexible in regards to that. So that's good. Uh, procedure definitions, C style functions or procedures, because they can return values like a status. Revisions. Okay, boot manager. So UEFI defines a boot manager, contains your firmware on your machine will have a boot manager to handle booting your stuff, which you can use to boot your other stuff, <laughs> work as an OS loader. It'll have non-volatile random access memory variables that we can probably look through, some global variables such as like the boot order of things on your machine. The UEFI image, the, the actual boot x64 EFI file that'll work as an OS loader. Um, it'll contain executable code. These things are defined as PE32+, plus, so 64-bit relocation in a otherwise 32-bit image. That's what the plus is for, 64-bit support. But this is a normal, normally a Windows executable kind of thing, although it can run on any OS as long as you code for it. So instead of ELF, this specifies PE32+, plus, right? But that's all right. Um, some values in there. 
to specify EFI as opposed to some other regular, say, Windows EXE. Um, it, it has a specific subsystem, and the subsystem that we're going to be using is the one for an EFI application, which is number 10. I'm not going to be writing boot services or runtime drivers. I'm writing an OS loader, but you could write your own drivers if you want, and you would use different numbers for the subsystem. I'll be coding for x64, so the machine type will be hex8664. And these things should be within, um, within the actual binary that we write. So like the wiki, the wiki page on portable executables, if I go to like the structure here, just as an example, um, we have fields in here like the machine field. I think this machine field is what's going to correspond to the hex 8664. You know, it's an actual byte value within the headers of the, the executable. I guess four bytes into the cough header, for example, here. And the subsystem is like somewhere down here. <laughs> There's things here, yeah, it might just be this general subsystem field, which is like, this is four, so f I don't know, hex, hex 5C, I guess, might be that. But anyway, these are actual fields within our executables. So it, just, it might help to see that it, rather than these just being random defines, they correspond to numbers in the EXEs. So I don't think I have like a, a file thing or anything, right? I don't have a file, or a, I do have type, but... I don't even think I have read elf. I guess I have object dump. That might low that might know different things. Let's see. Like, can this tell what kind of file this is? Okay, it knows it's it knows it's a format. It knows there's sections in there. I don't know how to look at if I can look at like the header info for that. I am not too sure to be honest. I know it can know and disassemble it, but display the contents of the headers. X maybe? I don't really know. Should I know how to use this tool before recording? I, I probably should, but we have things like data directories and stuff. Okay, major minor version, size of code, the image base, this kind of stuff. Subsystem A, which is 10 in decimal. Yeah, EFI application. So it is actually in the executables that we're writing, just to make sure, just to you know drive that point home. We know, we know the architecture. I was hoping we'd have like, you know, a byte value of the struct with like the architecture thing. So there's other tools you can get. There's like viewers or whatever they call them to look at PE files. I just don't have one open right now because I forgot to do that and prepare more, but that's all right. So let's just assume that you know that these things are good <laughs> and they correspond to what we're doing. Applications, we have memory types, so they're different. When you're getting things like allocating a pool of memory, you can specify a memory type. And the memory type for our EFI images themselves are defined within the spec, usually as this loader code or data for executable code or, you know, read-write data, what have you. Uh, boot and runtime services also have their own data types. So, you know, don't run over memory. That's for boot services if you want to use boot services, that kind of thing. Um, and getting, like, the memory map... Because uh, there's a, eh, whatever it's called, there's like a get memory map thing. Yeah, get memory map, like th this will return memory descriptors, and the memory descriptors will have the type of memory that it is, you know. So you, we can interrogate that stuff later to see what memory is actually available on the machine or on our emulated machine, whatever we want. And that'll be, and, and some of those memory types will say literally, you know, loader code or loader data if we map the values to these values. But anyway, that's defined in the specs. So that's fine. That's defined later on. UEFI itself will boot your image, probably using the load image function internally. So that's kind of cool. It, it kind of specifies how your programs are going to be loaded within the spec, which is nice. And it's just here. It's open. It's available. You can see, hey, it's going to use this function here. It'll give you a device path, which is sort of an abstracted ACPI namespace kind of thing that UEFI defines. You can look through device path nodes to see, you know, what is this? What is our image connected to? What, what disk is it? Is it a, a SATA disk or SCSI or something? Uh, we, might, we might be able to do that. In OS loader is what we're going to write. However, we can call exit or exit boot services, and that'll actually... Uh, you know, turn off the boot services and ensure that you have control of all the memory from that point. 
Yeah, they're terminated, including memory management, and the OS loader is responsible for the continued operation, such as loading an OS and going on from there. Uh, drivers we can call into, assuming they're implemented. You can also load drivers and stuff dynamically. There's code to do that. If you want to look that up in the spec, I won't be doing that, but it is available. Uh, and there's ways to update firmware and get security keys for TPMs and stuff as well. But anyway... Let's see, past there, these are the runtime services that should be available. As far as these, I'll probably use maybe only Reset System. They have stuff for paging and converting pointers between physical and virtual addressing. However, for 64-bit, which is what I'm coding for, on boot, we're going to be in long mode and everything will be identity mapped, essentially. So I can set up paging later in the OS, I think, if I want, after calling exit boot services, and that'll be... That'll be okay. We can just set up different page tables later. That's with level five paging or something, for example. All right, calling conventions. Here we get into a little bit more meat and potatoes here. So functions or EFI procedures, whatever, will be prefixed or they will have and contain EFI API. So we go to any of these functions that are defined in booter runtime services, for example. Wait for event. They're all gonna have EFI API pointer as the type but this isn't really specified within the spec what EFI API is, right? You can't do a define on it because you don't know what it is. Well, it just represents an abstract calling convention that we're gonna use. And for 64-bit, which is defined a little bit after this, x64 platforms here, basically the calling convention is the Microsoft calling convention since everything for the spec was seemingly, <laughs> you know, really Microsoft oriented. This looks like a, a Microsoft developer, you know, uh, page on the web <laughs> with the parameter markers and everything. But uh, regardless, the calling convention we're going to use is for the MS API. And I have that. Um, let's go into here. I don't have that right now, right? But I'll, I'm going to be putting these things like in an EFI header. So I'll just add that as the first thing, the calling convention, right? So EFI API defines the uh, let's say calling convention for functions, you know, EFI, I'll say EFI defined functions. So, but what, what is this really? Uh, let's go into the, I'll get the hello EFI one just because I know it's defined here. Okay, I took it from GNU EFI, but I'll just put that here for example. So I took this from GNU EFI, but you know, you don't have to do this all, it's just saying we're defining it as the Microsoft calling convention, because that's basically what it is. That's what it lays out in the spec, pretty much one for one. So everywhere we see EFI API, that'll be replaced with attribute MS API, such as in a function, if we're calling like EFI API pointer, you know, get, get memory, whatever, get memory map, for example. That'll just say the calling convention for the functions as far as passing arguments within registers or on the stack that's going to follow the MS API. So that's easy enough. All right. Make sure you handle your nulls and everything. The compiler can handle this in and align it and all. If we're doing assembly, it'd be different, but since I'm using C, the compiler should handle all this, at least for Clang or GCC. Okay, and then we get to some good stuff, some data types. EFI defines its own data types. We can define those ourselves to follow along with the spec and just yell out everything like Microsoft wants us to do because lowercase letters weren't invented until the 21st century. Everyone knows that. They just took up too much space. You'd rather have the computer yell at you every time you do something. So it's all caps. <laughs> Booleans are a little bit interesting. These are keywords in C and they should correspond to you know one or zero, right? But this says specifically it's a one byte value, not one bit or anything. So I will probably define these as like a UN8, for example, just so we know it's a one byte value containing a zero or one for false or true. But in C, generally, we should be able to define a Boolean as a UN8, for example, and use zero or one and use false or true and have it work. Um, hopefully no bugs show up from that. But I can copy these things over and I'll do that. Needed a blank spot to uh, zoom in. So this isn't great, but I'm, I'm just going to copy over like this stuff into my efi.h file here. Let's say data types. And I should put where these are at in the spec, right? So where was this stuff? Calling conventions is, is 2.3. 
Um, let's say UEFI spec 2.10, um, section 2.3, just so I have these things saved and I don't have to uh, worry about that. I can look them up later if I need to. Um, and I'll do type defs for these, not defines. So let's say we have a boolean, and boolean will be something like un8. But I do need un8. And we'll say un8t. Now if I need that, I'll, I will need to do, you know, standard int or another header that has these fixed width integer types defined. So I'll do that as well. I think that's how you do type defs, right? I don't remember. <laughs> Um, and I don't have anything here, so let's say we have an EFI main. We won't do anything there. I'll redefine this in a minute, but let's just say we're doing that. And we'll include EFI.h. So can I run stuff from the shell? Nope, because I have a terrible dev environment. All right. Unknown type name. I forgot how to do type defs in C. Let's do it afterwards. And I'll put zero equals false, one equals true. Okay, there we go. And it wants me to do void because I don't have anything in there right now. All right, that's just making sure it compiles. Nothing's gonna happen, but you know, we make sure it compiles there and we have a bootx64 file, so. Okay. I forgot how to do type diffs, that's okay. <laughs> So we have booleans there, but I need to define something there first. Um, I can define u and 8 t as a boolean as well, that's fine. We'll keep it in the order that it has over here probably. So an int n is native width, which is eight bytes on 64 bit or 16 on 128. So int n and u and 8 n. So I'll do, I'm on a 64 bit system. So I'll say it's a u and 64 for an int, that would be an int 64. And we have int eight and so on and so forth. I already have u and eight there. Um, okay. So I'll line these up to look slightly better. And then 16, 32. S8, 32G, okay. And also 64, which is gonna be these, but by another name. So when we see these types, like in function definitions or in protocol fields or something, then we'll know, you know, we can use them in our code to look the exact same and they'll be typed def to their bitwise counterpart, we'll say. There's also 128, I will not be using these Probably, because I'm not on like a RISC-5 128-bit system, but that's all right. Uh, then we have char8, which is a one-byte character for ASCII encoding. So we can define char as that. It doesn't say if, if it's signed or unsigned. All one-byte are ASCII characters. 8-bit ASCII format. Well, 8-bit is not 7-bit, which is only 127, but I don't know. We'll, we'll say we can type def char. If it's bad, then we can change it later. But that doesn't come up too often. Usually it defines char16 as their fields, which is two byte characters, which is UCS2, although UTF16 is UCS2 but more. <laughs> it's a superset. Other than surrogate pairs, which are fun to program around, but if we limit our UCS2 usage to not use surrogate pairs, um, so we limit our code points up to all Fs and not in the the... D range or whatever for surrogate pairs will be fine and we can use UTF-16 types. So for that, it's a little iffy coding to have it supported everywhere, but I will define char16t as that if it's available on my system, which would mean I need uchar.h. However, sometimes when I'm compiling, like with Clang on my system that didn't natively support it, for example, sometimes my program doesn't find this. My compiler, my make doesn't find this. So while it's not a C standard thing, unfortunately, 
it will be in I think C2X, but we can do uh, some compiler magic here and we'll say if, I think it's double underscore, if has include, you know, this file here, and the compiler will say, you know, it'll be true or false. Um, but if, if this is found in the system header files, essentially, then I'm going to include it to use it for our char 16T, our UTF 16T types. So that's all this is doing. And this should be in the C standard for C23 or what have you. But right now for C17 that I'm using, because that's not fully supported yet, um, you know, I'll have to include it manually. But that's okay. So we'll do that. And then for this down here, I'll say if... Um, it's if def, right? I haven't done these things in a while. Usually I don't like macros, so. So I think that's just uchar h is what's going to be defined within this file here. So if that's defined, then we can do char 16t. That's char 16. All right, else and end and if. And this might be wrong and I'll have to redo things, but I forget how the preprocessor stuff works. If we have this defined, I want to take the char 16t type in there, else I'm going to make the char 16t type, which is uint least 16t, and define that as char 16t, right? So really what I can say is, if not defined, is that how this works? I forget if it's if and if. I don't know. It'll probably tell me that's wrong. So I can just do this in one step, right? If we don't have that, then I'll make our own char 16t type. And then I can define that as char 16. And we can use that to define our char 16 here. Okay. This will be code points um, less than equal to that. Well, 16 bit, right? Whatever it is. Code points or surrogate pairs. Um, okay. Well, 4, 8, 12, 16. Yeah, I can't do math. I'm a little tired. Sorry about that. But that'll work, I think. Because if this is defined, it'll include a char 16t type. So does that work? Probably not. Let's do, do I have to make clean? Remove the target. Yeah, or we can, we can remove that ourselves. And it says, oh, we need a semicolon. That's all right. Okay, there we go. All right, so if not defined, define our own and use that. All right, after that, what else do we have? Void. Undeclared, we'll just type dev void to void, I guess. EFI GUID, we'll need that, which will be a struct. I'll make it a struct. It is normally like just a buffer, but the GUID is here, and I'm probably going to grab my other one because I'm lazy and I've already done this and I don't have that. Do I just have it as? What do I have it as? I could have sworn I had. GUIDs in this somewhere. Maybe I don't. Oh, in the hello example, I don't. And the stuff I've been doing elsewhere, I do, but that's all right. That is defined within the spec, so that's okay. That is in an appendix all the way down here, GUID and time formats, so we can do that. And we'll say time low is four, so we'll say you went 32, time low, you went 16. Time mid, time high inversion, if you can't read that because they don't, you know, effectively, they, they don't audit their stuff for legibility. It's the same bug like on HTML, and if not, they just can't copy HTML to make a PDF correctly, but that's all right. Time high and version. Clock sequence high and reserved field. And I went over this in the, the GPT image creator videos. I looked at the RFC for this and that defines it a little bit better, but that's fine. The version, uh, the version and variant of GUID we'll be using is encoded within these fields and the time high inversion and clock sequence high and reserve fields specifically. So, you know, the higher bits of these fields set the version like a, an all random GUID or UUID value. We'll have a four, for example, for the version and the variant will be, I think, two, stuff like that. 
lock sequence low is going to be u and eight. And then we have six bytes for the node. So we'll just do that node six. There we go. That's a GUID and it should be packed, but just to make sure I'll make it packed, right? I'll do that. Okay. Not great, but that's what I'm going to do. EFI status is a status code type u int n. And the status codes that we'll use and define for things are also at the end in an, in an appendix. Appendix D specifically has, has status codes for a lot of the functions. They all pretty much return a status code, like just look at read, read disk here. They're all going to return an EFI status. So we need to know what that is. And this provides ranges for these. 64-bit 0 to 1 and all Fs. Those are going to be warning codes. Starting at 2 and above are going to be warning codes. 4 to 7 and all Fs. Warning codes for OEM usage. UEFI spec. Error codes are 8 and all zeros to 9 and all Fs. Up to, you know, A, A and zeros there. So basically we can check for an error if we have something like if EFI error status code, which that function isn't defined within the spec, but you'll see that commonly in, in GNU EFI and elsewhere. All that's doing is checking if the high bit is set in the EFI status, right? For a 64 bit number, if the highest bit is set, it's gonna be an error. If it's not, it could be a warning. If it's all zeros, as defined here, it's gonna be a success. So that's easy enough to check for, for your function returns, for your error handling. If it's not success or if the high bit is set, you can check for an error here or a warning otherwise if it's not zero. And this defines the error codes and it says they're high bit set versus clear. So we can check for these. And these are defined, the error codes, within each you know, function that uses that returns a status. So for example, read, if we're reading a file, it returns a status and those are defined within each function down here, what it can return success, then we're good. Otherwise, we can get an error of no media, or maybe a warning, but if we get no media, it has no medium, you know, so on and so forth. Device error, corrupted, too small, and all of these are defined in the statuses. So we'll see, not ready, we'll see device error, volume corrupted, no media, you know, these are defined. So we can look for if it's a 12, or if we type def the 12 with the high bit set, as no media, we can check in our code if status is no media, we know we don't have a disk, for example. That makes error handling a little easier if we want to go that route. If I can put this window over, there we go. What is that status? You went in, okay. So I'll put that down here, add macro or other thing for checking if We'll say EFI status high bit is set. Uh, if so, it is an error status. All right, but other than that, we can handle that later. If I handle, handle is going to be a void pointer, void pointer, if I handle. So a handle is nothing but a, an abstract or an opaque reference to memory. That's all a handle is. If I event as well, just a way to have these things laid out. A logical block address. If I OBA, it's going to be 64-bit OBA for our disk handling, our reading or writing block IO. Task priority level I will not be using, but I guess I'll lay it out here anyway. I probably won't be using it. But you can lay out, you know, event architectures and stuff like that. Infrastructure, rather, using tasks. And we can signal a task to be set at a certain point. We can check for that. And it will, like, run code. You know, we can have callbacks and things using that, I think. Um, I probably won't get that big into it. But anyway. MAC address, 32-byte buffer. I mean, I can lay that out, but probably not use it. We'll say... Well, this is... If we laid out like this, it's not, it's a little harder to move things around having fixed array types. So I probably won't mess with Mac address or any of these unless we do internet stuff. But that's all right. Numerated types, we'll have regular C enums. That's fine. It'll be an int. Size of void pointer is going to be the size of a pointer on your architecture. Eight bytes for mine. 
bit fields will be bit fields. I haven't seen these rarely if, if ever, but I haven't looked at stuff that would use them. Then we have this kind of stuff. So just parameter markers and EFI API is the calling convention that's been defined. I have that defined there. Other than that, we'll have like parameter markers and things. So table 2.4. Um, I guess I'll do this 2.4. So how do you define like an in parameter? Well, we can just define it as nothing and it's a blank. It's just purely visual that says, hey, this thing is an input or an output or it's optional. It could be null. Yeah, null may be passed if it's not supplied. Uh, constant can be constant though. So I'll just uh, define const as const, effectively. So we can just replace const with const, and that's fine. I think that'll be all right. If I API is defined there, okay. All right, so that's just data types we can use. Did I define these things all right? You know I did, that's good to know. Okay, IA32, we're not doing that. We're on 64 bits, so we have the handoff state if you want to look at that as well. But we're going to be using long mode. This defines how that's laid out. Detailed calling conventions it goes over, but before that. So when this boots, when UEFI boots our 64 bit machine, we will be in long mode, in 64 bit mode. Paging will be enabled, and memory space will be identity map. So anything that UEFI can find for memory, it's going to be one to one physical to virtual. So we shouldn't have to mess with it, it'll be mapped in. And when we exit boot services, that won't change unless we change it by setting an address map. But what that means is we can use paging later on within an OS that we load effectively. At least I'm hoping, because I don't want to mess with paging in the bootloader if I don't have to. If it's identity maps, that's fine with me. Our kernel can be um, a higher half and things later. And if that messes things up, I'll change it. If not, we'll just go with it. Okay, selectors are flat. Don't have to worry about the segment selectors. Uh, GDT and things, IDT, we can set up in the OS as well. That's just not really mentioned. Uh, other than this, <laughs> interrupts are enabled, although no ISRs are supported other than boot services timer functions. So the timer is going to constantly be ticking effectively, which is good for timing purposes. That's good to have. Direction flag is clear, so stuff like uh, repeat store string byte will increment, you know, DI or SI accordingly. By default, um, other uh, flags are undefined. 128 kilobytes of stack. That should be more than enough for anyone, right? And the stack is going to be 16 byte aligned, which will follow calling conventions. Loading points. I don't know what EM or I guess that's task segment. That's going to be zero or something. Preserve all memory map marked as runtime code and data, which is what we're, we're not going to mess with that. So that's fine. That should be okay. We can call runtime service functions in long mode with paging enabled, which it will be by default, as long as things are set to identity mapped stuff. And basically stuff that's set up on boot, we want to keep it that way to be able to, to use runtime services. That's all that's mentioning. Um, if we set up paging later though, we can use reclaim memory. I don't think we can use this, but maybe we can later. But there's special memory types. They need to be four kilobytes, so page aligned. Or at least page, yeah, page aligned and one page in size. Memory descriptors, that being runtime, must be aligned. All right, config tables and stuff. Okay, we'll deal with that later as we need to be. Handoff state. We should be able to handle the SMBIOS table if we want to look at that, but anyway. If you want to code an assembly or an inline assembly or what have you, and you need to know how things are set up, RCX will have a handle and RDX will have the system table. This will be part of our image entry point later, the return address it was called from as well. So if we look down, and this is later on anyway, loaded image protocol. Um, maybe not that specifically. What, what was I looking for? Let's just search for the system table. Okay, this is what I was looking for. It's in chapter seven. There's just too much stuff in the spec. EFI image entry point under 7.4. So this is going to be just for reference to the handoff state when we get the input image handle and system table that it's referencing in RCX and RDX according to the calling convention. 
This is the type def function for the entry point in our program, in our OS loader application, the bootx 64efi program. This is going to be our entry point, not the regular int main argv argc stuff, but this. The firmware will pass in an image handle and a system table, which we can reference for everything else in firmware that we can interact with. So it's pretty nice. One single, you know, input point. So uh, if we want, we could type def this right now, and that wouldn't be bad. We will have to type def the system table anyway, but so it won't work until we do that, but that's okay. You can always lay that out here. I'll say entry point so I can search for it later in the code if I want. And we'll say UEFI spec 2.10, 744. So I have a reference to it in the spec. And when I'm going about writing, you know, the function type defs and things, I'm just basically gonna type it how they have it laid out which isn't the best way. Probably, I don't know. It's kind of annoying. Every and everything yell at you and be Microsoft oriented, but that's fine. I'll just do this in handle, the image handle. And we'll have in EFI system table. It won't know what system table is, and that'll be a pointer. But that is all right, and that's it. So we'll just, I guess, do it like that. Or, I mean, how they have it, they are inconsistent with their, uh, with their documentation. Like you'll see, you'll see random, you know, indentation out to here, indentation not at all. Or in this case, it's you know, in by two spaces or whatever. So I'll probably just go with whatever my system does by default when I'm typing, <laughs> which would probably be like you know there. So that's fine. I guess that's eight spaces, which I don't really like. I'd rather do four spaces, like there, but whatever. Um, we'll have that defined, and right now, I'll say remove this uh, system table definition when ready. When I actually define the system table later, I'll say when it's actually defined later. This is just so my program can compile, right? Just to show that you can write in type defs because we have the parameter markers like in and out defined and it'll still compile. So we'll say EFI system table right now. I'm just gonna make that void, so that's fine. But we do wanna remove that later. All right, there we go. Um, and this is a thing that is kind of annoying in C. I changed the header and the thing that uses the header isn't um, updating, right? But GCC and Clang have nice things to handle that for you. But we would need the objects to be defined because the depends, if we use something like MMD in our compiler flag, our C flags, then that's defined to make an object. And it's defined in terms of make rules. So. We have a target. I can define the target as like, we have EFI.C, it would be EFI.O, for example. So target, I need my source, which is EFI.C. I can define it instead as, you know, we'll say like object. An object can be EFI.O, or it can be like source, where dot C equals dot O. You know, in case we have multiple sources and we can do it like that without having to lay it all out manually. Let's say we need to make the object and our C flags. I will add in, well, this is an M, so I'll add it after there, I guess, MMD. So MMD is gonna generate um, make dependencies for this file, for the object for the file, and it will include any headers that it's using. So our EFI.h will include that in a make target and make a file called .d, as far as whatever the object's gonna be named. So we'll say .o equals .d. So if we have EFI.o, it'll be EFI.d for a file. I'll say it's the depends file, um, which is not the adult diapers, but what we can do is include, let's prefix this with a, a minus. So the first time they're not gonna be there, but we don't want that to error out. We want it to be generated, and it's okay if they're not there the first time we compile. So I can start off with the hyphen or the dash, the minus here, and include 
uh, whatever files we need for the depend dependent you know dependencies I guess. Um, there's also a tool I think make depend or make depends which does somewhat the equivalent, but I can just handle it with the C flag here MMD. Um, but what this will do after the first time compiling, it should make the dash or the dot D file linker input unused. That's not great, but this will make an EFI.D file and we'll have the dot O file and nothing to be done. That's good. And the dot D file is going to be dependent on, you know, to make the EFI.O object, it just generates a line that says dot C and dot H are needed to make the dot O. So then when there's a change, when if there's a change in the dot H, that would be included here. So it's the same as copy and pasting that here, right? That's all this line is doing, is doing this. It's just copy pasting that in. But if we have more than one file with a bunch of headers, we don't want to manually do this. We can do it automatically. And then now that that's a dependency and a make target for the dot O, when we make this dot O, it'll go down here and say, oh, we need these other files to make that. So if we have changes in the header file, you know, right now it's not going to do anything, but if we make a change, I'll just put a, uh, a line there. Never mind, I don't know what I'm talking about. It doesn't actually change it. It should remake the file, ideally. That's what I wanted to have, to have happen there. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Never mind. That's because I put in an S here. Um, let's call this objects. <laughs> Maybe there's multiple later. Okay, if you name it the right thing, then it knows what it's looking for. Before that would have been empty because there was nothing there, yeah. Okay, it makes it again because the header changed and then we don't have to do it. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to show. If we get rid of that extra line, the header changed and it needs that to make the object, it remakes the object. I do have EFI main there. Well, we can lay it out actually. We can do the, uh, the type def if we want. I laid out the type def. We don't really have to lay it out as a type def, if, but if we're going to call other images, we do. But our main is going to look like this. So let's lay that out. And I'm going to call it EFI main, but it's going to be of type image entry point. Um, and we'll take in handle image handle and, you know, system table system table. Okay, at least we have the main thing here. We have our main entry point set up. That way we have that there. All right, I don't like these warnings though. Unused parameter, that's true. Move this line when using input parms. We'll just cast them to void and not worry about our day. That's just to prevent compiler warnings. Although we can turn off that warning if we want, but that'll get rid of that. Okay. I don't know why it says linker input unused for these two things. That's interesting. Did the MMD really cause that? Maybe it did. I just don't get why I'm getting I might want to fix this warning because I really don't like things giving me warnings. Oh, it's just unused. The input is unused. So why is it unused? I don't know. I'll worry about that later when we're actually doing things. Maybe it's optimized away because we're not doing anything. I don't really know. If I remove MMD, does it give me the warning? That's what I want to know. Am I making it bad? It does. Okay. I guess because it wants it in separate steps. It does know how to make the source file automatically, though. I like that that's built into Cling. I don't like that. Or I'll just put that back. Well. Oh, it just depends where I put it in? <laughs> okay. If I put it in like down here, it says it complains, but I put it in up there and it doesn't complain. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Let me add more stuff here. Let's do, let's say all dots. If we make other EFI files, other dot O files, I don't need to prefix it for the current directory, I don't think. 
and all depend files because we still have those in there. Okay, yeah, then it gives me the warning again. Well, that's lame. I'll see later about that because I don't really want it there. Let's see if it gives me the same thing for GCC. I'm curious. It does not. Okay, it might be a clang only thing. Maybe it optimizes away and it doesn't like it, but uh, oh well. Either one works. If you need the cross compiler, then cross compiler should also work. Maybe I'll use that until it gives me a warning and I'll switch back. <laughs> I don't really know. But uh, that's all right. All right, I'm wasting too much time, so let's go back. I am tired today. Sorry about that. I just wanted to lay this stuff out. So where was I at forever ago? Loaded image, I talked about the entry point, I guess. Handoff, calling conventions. This just lays out how the MS ABI works. The Microsoft calling convention. You can look that up on Wikipedia right here. X86, 64 calling conventions, Microsoft X64. It's not, it doesn't include all the registers this does on this page, but it's basically the same thing. These are the same registers for the input arguments for integers and five and above are gonna be on the stack, so on and so forth. You only have to really worry about this if you're writing inline assembly or if you're writing this in assembly, but you can look at that yourself if you want. Or if you're using, if you're using intrinsics, we'll probably use XMM, but it's 128-bit stuff. So boot services define where page is not enabled. Okay, translations are enabled, but mapped virtual equal physical, 64-bit identity mapped, that's fine. If we define or use our own page tables, uh, global descriptor table or interrupt descriptor table, we must ensure the firmware executes correctly, effectively. That's true, all right. What's after that? Protocols. Protocols come with their own unique ID, their own data structure definition and services, which are functions you can call for the protocol effectively. Uh, you can deal with task priorities if you wanna do events and timing stuff. But this is kind of how they're laid out. You know, you have a handle, and a handle can be attached to protocols that support, you know, the, the device that's represented by the handle. You can invoke a function, you can call a function on the protocol. So calling a function pointer in a struct is all this is saying. Protocol functions there that work from those. So here's an example. You're getting a device handle. You want to illustrate something here for that device calling a function in the struct of the protocol to make a flashy, noisy effect. Okay. Loaded image protocol is what's used for our EFI application. It's, a, it's an EFI image that's booted, that's loaded into memory. So, you know, you can look at that if you want. We'll probably define that later as needed. And this goes over, you know, all these protocols. We'll be using simple text input and output for getting text input and output. Simple pointer protocol. Although this isn't, I haven't found a way that UEFI and QEMU specifically supports this for mice. This will be for mice. But my laptop does support this, so I will be doing basic mouse support as an example. I'll probably just be doing keyboard-driven stuff for what I do, but I'll show that it does support a mouse on hardware, right? So if you're wondering how to do a mouse in EFI, we'll do that. Uh, for me, I had to connect handles to this protocol and go through that stuff, but we'll get to that later. This goes over, you know, all the protocols here and requirements for stuff. Uh, host bus controllers for PCI, that kind of, you can read into this if you want. Device drivers. It goes fairly in depth. Hot plug events. If you have to worry about plugging in USB, that might be interesting. Cryptographic algorithms. Hell yeah. EAP, TLS. Because it does have network support. <laughs> you can write it. A web server in EFI, should you wish. Maybe you shouldn't, but you can. Boot options, boot manager. We should be able to look at NVVARs with get or set variables and set boot options, although you can set that within your BIOS on your machine as well, so I might not. But it might be interesting to look at them if I remember, you know, 10 weeks from now when I'm on episode two <laughs> with how long I take between these videos. Uh, but that's all right. Globally defined variables. We should have boot options and the current and next and ordering for those. Console input device, output device, uh, which will include standard error and standard out. Input would be standard in, for example. Cryptographic stuff, this all, this stuff. <laughs> this, this just makes me giggle. I've been on the internet too much. 
I just like that key exchange keys are there. That's ah, uh, that's funny. Okay, <laughs> they should put a W, right? Make it a kick W. Anyway, I've been on the internet too much. So secure boot stuff. <laughs> Vendor keys, console in out and error out. Timeout variables. All right, we can look at variables later if we want, if they're available. Now, how would you boot other things, or how would your system boot your image that you're writing, your OS loader? It'll use the simple file system or load file protocols. Since I'm using an EFI system partition, it should boot via the simple file system protocol. And we can use stuff with this protocol to look at the file path and other things if we want. We should be able to. We can connect controllers to uh, device handles and things on the device path. And that's, I think, what I, yeah, that is what I used for simple pointer protocol. This just says you can use it for the other things. But okay, then what do we have? Removable media boots. If, for example, you're writing to a USB stick, which I'm doing, we want our file to be named this, which it is named that. And the, the executable machine type, those bytes in the PE file, they are this number, so we're good there. Boot via load file. If you do not have the EFI system partition and all that, and it doesn't directly support a file system, it'll use the load file protocol. And we can also use that if we want for our own stuff to load other files on the disk. Or ideally, we can use file system pro protocol. So if we have files in the EFI system partition, like under EFI boot next to our EFI image, maybe we have a file describing uh, the data partition of our disk image and files located in that data partition that are used for the kernel or a font or something, then we can load them if they're, well, that's in the data partition. But if we have a file in our file system on the EFI system partition, the FAT32 file system, we can find and load that with the simple file system protocol. So we might do that later. Um, there's also network boot support, PXC, Pixie booting, pre-boot execution environment. And it should be extendable to future media. Okay, and then we actually get to actually writing stuff. <laughs> With the entry point, I could have just gone here and not to 744. It defines the same thing here. Why didn't I just read as I was going? That would have been easier. That's okay. That is all right. You can write drivers or OS loaders, which is what I'm going to be writing. A UEFI OS loader, which is defined up there. There are no differences in the entry point. So these describe things. This describes how the system table is laid out for the entry point. So I guess I can write that... It's actually in section 411. Yo, what's the 411? I don't think people have said that since like 2002. What's the 411, G? I don't know. What's the info? But we have this laid out, how they have it laid out. I guess I'll line up my variables though. But okay, pointer to the system table. So our image is going to be loaded by firmware using load image. It should implement that itself and invoked through start image. So if you want to load your own stuff, or if you're writing firmware and want to know how it works and you're loading a boot x64 EFI file, for example, you can use load image and start image for the supported way to do that. And we'll also have pointers from the system table to boot and runtime services. It'll have an image handle, which is we can we can use loaded image protocol and device path to get sort of the hardware device that our application is loaded from. So ultimately, like the disk that it's running on, we can locate that through these things if we want. There are other ways to do it as well. This is one way you could. Uh, you can load and unload images. Boot services exit we can use. We can use exit boot services as well. Not confusing, but that's all right. So we can call exit. If we don't get all the way to exit boot services, for example, and it can exit and shut down gracefully, we'll say. Um, it's meant to be if it fails. <laughs> but exit boot services and loading an OS is meant to be you're good and want to go on to run an, op an operating system. We can shut down the machine. One method of doing so is to reset system. Runtime service, I will be doing that because it's easy. We can mess with ACPI way later on. Uh, we have a table header. This is at the start of the boot and runtime services tables. And these are status codes that we can return from our entry point, which is fun <laughs> if we want to return this stuff. And if, well, really, if the, U, if the firmware can't load your stuff, I guess it would return this. Um, otherwise, it would load in the driver and stuff. Anyway, I don't know. 
table header, let's look at that, because that's going to be included in definitions for boot and runtime services. So I'll just lay out how it has here, signature and revision. So we'll say EFI table header. That'll be in section four, four, two, one for this. And we also have a header size and a CRC value, cyclic redundancy checking and a reserved should be set to zero and not messed with value. This will be if I table header. All right, so we have a signature for that revision. CRC, all this stuff. The system table, hey, that's gonna be useful. We need that to locate everything else. It has pointers to boot and runtime services, all the protocols and everything you can interact with in your firmware will be available through the system table, which is input to the entry point to your EFI image. And if you wanna locate other ones, you can use the type def stuff up above, but I'm going to be probably just laying out uh, how the struct is laid out like this. And I wonder if I can just copy paste. <laughs> am I lazy? I mean, I am. Well, I mean, that mostly worked. Not, not great, but mostly worked. So EFI system table. And what is this then? 431. So we have EFI table header. Should be able to just do like, I mean, that's a lot easier just doing that. All right, that looks a little bit better. Oh, didn't want to do that. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna line things up here so I can actually read it, because that would be nice. So these things are all not going to be defined, right? I don't have, I didn't want to do that. I don't have all of these you know, defined in my header file, so it's gonna give me errors. So I'm not gonna really fill all these out, I just want this to begin with. Just so I have them all available, should I wish to use them later. All right, but stuff like ACPI and SMBIOS, those will be these config tables, the number of which is defined by number of table entries here. But all right, so stuff that we don't have defined would be simple input and output protocols for text and runtime and boot services. So. What I can do in lieu of that is change this later, but right now we can just say they're gonna be void so it won't give errors when compiling. Right, I'll just do that. We have table header defined right above. But I'll replace these with the, you know, the commented out things um, when I do that. Right now I'll just have them be void so they're not it knows how big they are, and these will be pointers, so they'll be as big as a pointer on our, on our architecture. Void pointer is fine for that. This just signifies that stuff is not implemented. So I might even use, well, that's, let me do this, just so it's different from how they have it laid out. And I'll just put, um, I'll put a note at the top. This is what I did in my other file. So we'll say void, void pointer fields in structs equals not implemented. They are not. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, okay. So output protocol we don't have. And runtime services. All right. This looks like 
Uh, this looks like booty right now. It looks very ugly, but that's all right. Compiling stuff, low level code, not really, but <laughs> lowish er, lowish er level code kind of gets ugly sometimes. Config table, I don't have defined either. So I'll just do that. Okay. But we'll fill these in, specifically text input and output to start off, because we need to be able to take input and do output. As long as we end with semicolon. Conflicting types, those are always good. Mm, do I do void for system table? Oh, you know I did. There we go, and now I can remove that. And since we have system table defined, we need that to be above this point, because people only write single pass compilers for C. I don't know why, there's nothing wrong with doing multi-pass compilers. I mean, assemblers have had multi-pass forever, but C doesn't, but there we go. Okay. All right. So we can fill these things out later, I just wanted them to be there. And if you want to know what they are, well, console input is input for text, of course. Output would be output for text, and we can get the hardware the device handles for those things if we want. And we, we will be using and looking at boot time and runtime stuff. So boot services table. We will need to lay out for a bunch of stuff. Um, we can either go, you know, down this point and be boring some more. You know, however long this video is going so far, which is probably like five hours, one hour. Editing this will be fun because <laughs> it's terribly boring. Uh, but that's all right. Let's get something on the screen for Hello World and I can call it there and go to bed because my voice is dying and I'm tired. <laughs> so, okay, let's do that. So let's say we want to do something in general right now. Let's say we want to do something like show output to the screen. We can define the text output protocol. Let's, let's do that. But it goes in order here. So boot, runtime services... Well, I say it goes in order, it doesn't really. Down here in protocols, console support, we'll find simple text input and output protocols. So let's say 12.4 for text output. Let's define this thing here. Now, I am sorry I'm smushing it, you know, halfway in between. It's just to get, get things on screen while I'm typing. But anyway, we can define that here. It needs to be before this point because it's defined within here. So let's say we have text output. Let's say we do this and we won't do void pointer. All right, we'll do that. Let's say if I simple text output protocol. And this will be 12. Four or twelve four one for the struct definition, and these structs are nicely defined. Where, <laughs> for at least for stuff like this, I mean, they define it with an underscore in the actual thing. They do that for a reason, but they define this protocol as having these functions. But the nice thing is, is that if we go down to one of the functions, these functions are defined in terms of using a protocol as an input pointer, right? Sort of an OOP styled, you know, this pointer or self or whatever. So we're effectively calling a function, passing in a reference to itself, right? Because object orientation. Uh, but this defines, you know, the function as needing the protocol and the protocol is defined as needing the function. And that's always fun, circular dependencies. Uh, you can do it like how they have it laid out, kind of. I don't think that works though. So how I'm going to do it, or how I like doing it, is just defining the struct as itself twice. <laughs> and that gets around, you know, defining something first, right? So this defines the struct as nothing effectively, but it needs a definition in order to further define functions for this protocol, right? Because they're circular dependencies. So we can do that, and then later on when we define the struct itself, you know, we can just do that, and that'll be okay. Um, I think we can put it here and we can say, okay, we're actually going to define this later on as this, <laughs> whatever's, you know, in this field. But to define functions up here that need the struct, you know, text reset or whatever, we need this first so it knows the reference to this within the functions. So that's always fun. Circular dependencies are always fun. 
But okay, we'll define, I want output, not input, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself here. All right, um, well, let's do that again because I didn't put a G on there, all right. So if I text reset, I'll just lay these out here. I don't have this defined yet. So again, these are I know these are all gonna be function pointers specifically for this, but I can just put pointers for these because I don't have them implemented yet. And I will implement them, um, at least for output string, for example, so we can write something on the string for a hello world example. So that I will actually fill out EFI text string output string, but this will effectively be a function pointer. The other stuff I'm not going to do right now or ever, so I'm just going to put um, placeholders here so it knows how big the, the struct is. But I'll name them so we know what they're supposed to be. We might do set mode later to mess with things. Set attribute to change the colors. Clear screen to clear the screen. We might use that as well actually, just so we can reset the screen and then do that. Uh, set cursor position, that'll set the text cursor position, or we can turn the cursor on and off and that won't really matter. Unless we, you know, have scrolling <laughs> where we press enter at the bottom of the screen, it'll still scroll up, but we won't see a visible cursor for this enable cursor function, if we turn it off. By default, I think it's on if you reset it. We could do the reset one as well, I guess. Just to make sure things are there. But okay, then we have a mode, which I'll lay out in a bit. All right, but that should lay out the protocol definition for the struct here. But I'll also, I guess I'll put that there twice. Um, but that's fine. We need that for these functions. Let's go to reset. Resets the console output device. We have the mode that we'll define later. Let's reset and write something to the screen for this. So I'm not just talking to a spec forever. <laughs> Actually, I'll put this here. I won't put this. Um, simple text reset, just EFI text reset. This will be 12.4.2. Just do this so it looks similarly to the thing. And we know they had an error here because they have a freaking slash. That's not supposed to be there. What are you doing? Amateurs, how much money does UEFI get every year to make a spec that doesn't even visually compute in their own documentation? Come on, man. But circular dependencies are fun. So since this defines the struct, we need it defined before we have it at this point. That's why I did this type def to itself up there. But in Boolean, we also have extended verification. I will not be doing that because I'm just going to assume things are going to work and be nice and hunky-dory, right? But now that we have this defined, the function, this will be defined, the function within the struct, and we can call it at runtime from our, uh, our EFI.C, right? So it's not gonna do anything and it'll return immediately, but unless we do something like a halt or a while loop and take up computations, so let's do that. So we'll just do that. We'll say right now, we, we have better ways of doing this later, like getting a keystroke and stuff, but right now we'll say infinite loop just for our, our example here. And I'm gonna return EFI success if we make it all the way to this point. Um, and I'm gonna call this stuff, but I don't think I have success defined. I do have status defined. So let's do EFI status values, appendix D. I believe it was appendix D. Yeah, status codes. So let's um, define those, define EFI success as zero. Although sometimes these are gonna be 64-bit values, so we can do ULL, I think, will be 64-bit compliant, but anyway, or ULL. 
I don't know if we have to do that. I mean, I can include it though, just in case we have type def stuff later. Or we can type def at the UNT64 as well. I don't know, we'll see how that works. <laughs> Unknown type name text string, yep. So we don't have the other functions defined. Yeah, so let's do that first. Because we're actually using them down here. But, well, let's put in this first and say we're using, I'll set up better variables for this later, but we have a system table pointer. We can access stuff through that. So I'll access our console in because that's defined in the system table. Right, we have our system table. We have a con in pointer and a con out pointer. I wanna use con out. I'm thinking about input, sorry about that. We want to use con out because that's where these things are defined on the protocol and they're defined as function pointers. So we have to dereference again to call those functions because they're pointers. And we can call text reset. We need to pass a this, which will be system table con out. It'll be a reference to that because it is a pointer. Well, we don't need a reference. That'll be a double pointer. And we need a boolean, I can do false. Um, I should just be able to do false, that's fine. But that'll reset, reset console output. And then we'll have a thing to write a string, which will be text string, we'll write that. I shouldn't be programming with just half the screen here, it's kind of annoying, sorry about that. Uh, we can clear the screen as well, I suppose. So let me, let me do that. But I'll have these defined in a second. So if I text, so I just called it clear screen. I don't need to call it if I text reset. That is the function pointer name. I need to call it the actual name here, like reset. <laughs> it's not great. Getting tired. All right, call reset. We'll call clear screen. I think you knew what I meant, right? Probably. And these will all take at least an implicit this to start off with. Um, the other functions, or the other uh, parameters will be different though, so I'll do that. Uh, but okay. Let's do this over here. Let's go to clear screen first. Just 1248. So let's just do that. We'll define text clear screen. It's gonna be EFI status, API pointer, and all it does is take in this. That's easy enough. So actually I can take out the other thing. Um, this is redundant for these, you know, comments here, but that's all right. But this will clear screen to background color. And, uh, and it will set cursor to zero, zero, and this is defined within the spec. Uh, right here, clear screen clears the display to the selected background color, position is zero, zero. The, by default, the background color should be black and the text color should be white, which will be basically the VGA colors is how they're defined as text attributes, which is defined within the mode and other things. We'll see that like under the set attribute function. I'm just, I'm not looking at that at the moment, uh, but that's okay. That's simple enough, we can check the return. We should be checking return values for these, but they should work. I mean, these are really simple. They should work by default, but we can check the return value if we want to be super, super duper uh, safe. I might do that for other, other functions later, not this one. All right, write a string to the output's device. This will be 4.3. 
hopefully I'm giving a sense of like how you would code for a spec. I mean, I'm writing exactly what it has, which is nice that we can do that, but I'm, you know, trying to follow it along saying, okay, if you want to look it up in this code and you don't have the spec, we, we know where it's at now. You can look that up. But this is kind of how I'm, how I'm coding these days. Uh, my work doesn't use too much specifications. It's all like IBM oriented and their documentations. They give the interface really nice. They don't give examples kind of like this, but <laughs> um, this is nice. It's all self-contained in one PDF. IBM's docs are like over 20,000 pages and it's terrible getting info out of them like pulling teeth. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I don't need to, to uh, complain about work right now. So string, that's partly why I'm so tired today. Anyway. Takes in a this, takes in a char 16. For the, it should be a pointer, right? Because it's going to be the string that we're writing. A string of UCS 2 bytes or UTF 16 bytes, which are 2 byte <laughs> pairs, effectively. Originally one 16 bit value, but it can be, you know, circuit pairs and stuff, but we'll just be doing one 16 bit value in a string for each character. Uh, typically for ASCII, the first eight bits will be the ASCII character and the second eight bits will be a null, for example, for those two bytes in this multi-byte character string for each character. Um, and I didn't go over it, but the UEFI spec does say in the first few chapters that it is little Indian oriented, nothing is big Indian. So we are guaranteed that things are going to be laid out in little Indian form as far as the spec is concerned. So you would have to convert if you're on, I don't know, PowerPC, big Indian or something, if your compiler doesn't do that for you, but... Yeah, we'll be doing stuff oriented for Little Indian because that's what the spec lays out. Uh, but okay, we'll write a string. How do we do that? Well, since we have char16 values and uchar.h, thankfully enough, we can cast a string, a string literal to char16t, or use a char16t string. Um, if we want to use a literal, or we can have values like a char 16 t array, for example, for strings, or a pointer to a string literal, but we can use little u, lowercase u, for UTF-16. Uh, UTF-8 will be available in C23 standard, or compilers probably implement it already, uh, but the regular, the u by itself, is a UTF-16, mostly compliant string, and this is equivalent to casting a, a string literal, if it's ASCII, to char 16 t you know, pointer it should be equivalent to that. I think hopefully I'm getting that right. But we can do this for string literals. UTF 32 would be U32, I believe, or maybe no, it's capital U, capital U. So the reason I'm doing this as well is I don't like wide characters because they're, they're, I think they're dumb because they're different on different platforms. They can be 32 bit or 16 bit or what have you. And I want things to be fixed with. So I know exactly what's going to be going into my, my code here, my program. So I know this is going to be guaranteed to be 16 bits per character. That's why I like using this. But anyway, testing. Hello, UEFI world. And we'll put a new line there. That's fine. And we'll have an infinite loop. And it should write this on the screen in the upper left corner after clearing it, assuming I wrote things all right. Um, and obviously I didn't, right? Because uh, this doesn't work. <laughs> System table has no... No con out member. As well as the other things that I need to fix. All right. Uh, oh, that's at 92. What did I mess up here? Didn't I mess something up here? E5.h9 uh, expected declaration specifiers or dot dot dots. Uh, oh, because I have a comma. Don't have a comma unless you want to put more than one parameter in your uh, function, duh. Don't do that. Um, to use true and false, we do need to include bool because we're not doing C23, which has it built in as keywords. I'm just dating this video by saying these things. I'm just, I'm excited for the new standards when they come out. There's some cool stuff in there. Um, and I misspelled those things again, of course. Uh, let's do this, uh, con out, con out. Only those places? All right. Thank you, substitution. You're nice. Okay, we made a file. And it did it twice. Oh, because of the depends, probably. It did it twice. Let me reduce that noise as well. I'm just going to do that. I want to know that I copied it over, but I don't need that line there. So 
Uh, we'll just say, okay, we did it once, we copied it over, all right. So I should also make a rule, if I'm using this in my repo here, I wanna actually run the thing. So after I build it, let's say we run the thing. If I GPT, it, it knows what text string I'm doing, right? I guess it doesn't. <laughs> let's say we run QEMU shell or bat or whatever. You can change this on your system or we can add in if, you know, if dependencies on like Windows or something. I think if equal, it's like a GNU extension to make. And then we can say if our OS variable is Windows or something, then we can do a bat. I might do that later. Right now we'll say we'll run our, uh, our file, but I need to actually make the disk first. So let's do that. And in there, that is going to be write GPT exe. Um, this file needs a VHD, so let's say we make a VHD in there. Maybe that'll work. Oh, it does not. Oh, well. It's not recognized. It did make it. That's interesting. But then it, didn't, it did not run the thing. These should be separate lines, no? Uh, QEMU.bat, that's what that is, right? Yeah. I could not load it. Oh, because it's in here. Um, but I have that in here. Is it loading it according to this? All right. Uh, I just want like a one-step thing to load and run, right? But I'm doing it from another directory, so I'm having issues because I'm bad at what I'm doing, so. <laughs> All right, let's run that. Let's just, uh, we'll CD into that actually. Let's do that. And I'll have to change these commands. If you're on Windows, you know, you might have to change the CP to copy or MV to move and stuff like that. So I apologize for that. I should put that in to differentiate depending on OS. Right now I haven't. Maybe there's built-in makefile things for that as well. I don't know. But let's CD into that bad boy. and then run this and then run that right let's do this and i might change this to do shell so i'm not assuming windows but uh okay there we go <laughs> i just have to know what i'm doing um, our text input screen is small but it does work right so we get this is um Location zero zero. I mean, some things might be a little different depending how it's emulating the screen and, and the order of operations when you're like clearing and setting the cursor position and stuff. This might not necessarily be zero zero on the, the visual screen. It depends on the text mode you're in because in EFI, technically a text mode is like a subset of the screen for drawing certain sized characters. So if you have like 80 by 20 for you know, text lines, that'll take up a lesser portion of the screen if you have a large screen, for example, depending how large the text is. Um, but this works. It says, hey, testing, hello, UEFI world. So we know our string works. It's doing nothing and wasting resources, so I'm going to cut it. But uh, that's a hello world example and way too many words. That took way too much time, like an hour and a half. Sorry about that. I'll probably cut it here. I may show a little image or video of it running on the laptop just to show that if you write our thing to a USB, maybe I can do that here. I got a USB here, USB A to C. So we have A and then C. I like this thing, it's very small, but it's, it's useful. Oh, maybe next video will be on Linux and show my Linux workflow again, but anyway. <laughs> Just differentiating, differentiating things here. Rufus, where are you? I think you put, I think I put you in programming. My GUI orientedness. UAC prompt would have blacked out the screen. Sorry about that. Um, let's select our stuff. I have my stuff under, I don't remember, see, it's under YouTube, under here, mine's under here, my VHD file. Write that sucker to my USB. It's gonna be however big it is, 44 megs, something like that, 30, 30 whatever megs by default. Right, that image. Oh, Rufus, you're updating. I'll do that later. Close that out. Take that out, and I will boot it. 
on my laptop. You know, and the USB port. I'm gonna take probably just an image of it and I'll post that here in the video to not take up more time and editing and space on my hard drive. So anyway, <laughs> hopefully that was okay. Let me bring my face off for a second. Hopefully that was okay for Hello World and way too much time, but I figured I'd go through the, the starting chapters of the spec if you were new to it and wanted to know, and if not, you can just skip ahead in the video, so that's fine. But hopefully that shows a little bit of how it's laid out and how we're going to go along with writing stuff, at least for protocols and function pointers on those protocols. And, you know, this is this. I'm going to set up, of course, like variables to not type all this out, <laughs> right? Because that's annoying. And we'll have helper functions and things for like printing formatted strings and all, right? This is just really basic example. We'll have stuff to get a key press. Maybe I'll do that on the next video. But this is an intro to writing actual, you know, EFI applications. Like the intro video, I guess. But this is a little more in-depth, right? And that shows, hey, you know, where did I type this stuff in from? Well, I typed it in from my keyboard from looking at the spec, or I copy-pasted. And that's how I'm going to go along with it. So, hope you enjoyed. Sorry it took too long and it's slow and I'm tired, but uh, that's how it is sometimes. And hope it was all right regardless. <laughs> and I'll see you on the next one. We'll write some more stuff. I might write helper functions for text, maybe change the colors, maybe fill out more of these things. Uh, Set the text mode, we'll say, and take in input from the keyboard with text input protocol and get keystrokes and stuff. I might do that on the next one. Maybe it'll go faster, we'll see. But thanks regardless. I'll see you then. Cheers.